Today is Friday, August 7th, 2015, and we are here at the ACLU Cleveland office with Marsha Levine, a longtime ACLU supporter and a past leader of the ACLU Cleveland chapter. Marsha has dedicated her career to supporting a variety of social justice causes, including civil liberties and especially women's rights. Your interviewer today is Kira Schoonover, intern with the ACLU of Ohio. Marsha, thank you for being here today. I'm let's, glad to do it. Let's start out with a few background questions. So where were you born? I was born in Lorraine, which is about 25 miles west of Cleveland. It's a steel mill town, or it was when I lived there. Um, it's fallen on hard times since then, but it's a, it was a very different place to grow up than Cleveland. It's a small town. Tell us a little bit about your childhood. What values were especially significant in your family? Um, well, my family was a, a committed Jewish family, and the values that go with Judaism have to do with responsibility for yourself and other people, um, and the focus on the world as it is now, uh, and what it needs to be better and to, uh, to be a safer, healthier, better place for people to live are values that come out of Jewish philosophy. How did growing up in Lorraine influence your perspective on civil liberties issues? Lorraine was a really interesting city because it was a steel mill town and had all the surrounding industry that supports steel making. Um, it, it attracted a, a wide variety of immigrants from um, countries all over Eastern Europe for the most part. Um, so it was probably the most diverse community you could grow up in if you're only thinking about white people at a very small African American population. Um, and not until after the war, after the Second World War, was there a Spanish speaking community. So the community I grew up in was. Um, at one time, there was a street in Lorraine that had more churches per square mile than any other street in the country. And each of them was a church, and our synagogue was also on that street, but each of them was a church from a different part of Eastern Europe. So there was the, or, or all over Europe really, because there was an Irish Catholic church, but there was also a Polish Catholic and an Italian Catholic, and so on. Um, so that diversity was very enriching. Um, um, but also it sensitized me to differences because we, we all went to school together. There was just one public school in our neighborhood. Um, the city had only one high school, so we really did all go to school together. So it was a very kind of uh, supportive place to be who you were and to practice your own traditions and I think that sensitizes one to the idea of civil liberties in general as lived, not legally, but as people live in the communities they live in and do what they do, that, that all of that was accepted. So I think it had a big influence on me. Where did you attend college and what degree did you receive? I went to Northwestern University and I went to the School of Speech with the idea that I was going to be a speech therapist, which turned out to be not a good idea at all, um, too much science for my taste, and ended up with a degree in public, Bachelor of Science in Public Speaking. How did you decide to attend Northwestern University? I think I was heavily influenced by the fact that my older brother went there. Um, and at the time, it seemed to me that a Big Ten school was what I wanted. And so I, the, all the schools I applied to were fairly good sized, Wisconsin, Syracuse. Um, and I think I, I chose Northwestern because my brother had such a great experience there. What was the university like at that time, demographically and politically? <laughs> um, well, it was an era in which there were Jewish sororities and fraternities and everybody else. Um, so Jews were not accepted in the other fraternities and sororities. Uh, so that was a factor. It was, it had, it had a history of being a very conservative place. 
Um, but there was a, I almost call it a subculture of liberals that I was attracted to. Um, we, um, we leafleted in downtown Chicago for Adlai Stevenson. We invited Norman Thomas to be our major, our speaker at our major um, all-campus public lecture. So there was some diversity of, of uh, political opinion, but not a lot. Where did you attend graduate school? I went to graduate school at Case Western Reserve when it was still Western Reserve to what, when I went there, was called the School of Applied Social Sciences, which is now called the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences. Um, but that's my alma mater. And um, I went to graduate school because uh, I had gotten a job at a small family service agency uh, when my son was about three and started nursery school as an just something that sounded interesting. And I, that's how I discovered the field of social work, and I discovered my aptitude and interest in it in that way, and that's why I went to graduate school. How did your time in graduate school influence your commitment to social justice? I don't know so much if it was my time in graduate school except for the education I got in the history of social welfare um, and what I learned which I hadn't known really statistically as a matter of fact about the percentage of people in our country who were underfed, underhoused, uh, lacking opportunities and all of that. That's part of the education of a social worker. So it, it fed my interest in uh, finding ways that were helpful to people in their lives. Although that's not the kind of work I did directly, I really was a counselor um, doing a clinical practice when I, when I was working. You started working at the Jewish Family Service Association, or JFSA, in 1966. What is the mission of JFSA? The mission of JFSA is strengthening families, strengthening the community. And one of the observations I've made about that is <coughs> Probably three quarters of all the organizations I've worked for as a volunteer in the nonprofit sector have a mission similar to that. Even IdeaStream, their mission is strengthening the community. Tell me about the work you did while at JFSA. I started out as a counselor. I was working with individuals and couples. Um, and during the time that I was there, uh, was the era in which the divorce rate began to climb dramatically. So in the, in the late 60s and early 70s is when divorce became um, really possible. The laws were a little less punitive, um, and subsequently they became much less punitive and much became unnecessary to say that somebody was a bad guy if you wanted to get a divorce, which is how it had been. Um, and what I observed in my work was that one day I said, you know, I've been, I have had four women in the process of divorce in my caseload today, just today. There has to be some more effective, efficient way to not say the same thing four times over because their issues are the same. And so I started um, with the guidance of a woman on our staff who was a specialist in group services. Uh, I started a group for women in the process of divorce. So that became a very big part of my practice. Um, we did a, a group for some 10 to 12 people, maybe two or three times a year. Um, and at, at a, a point in time, it was, it seemed only that you could have women, but then we thought about, well, why couldn't you have men and women in a group for people in the process of divorce? Um, because the fact that if they weren't going to be couples, if they were going to be men of one couple and women of another couple, so they wouldn't be doing their fighting in the group discussion, it was very supportive for them to hear a man's point of view and a woman's point of view about what the process of divorce was like and what their concerns were. So we did that for a while, and then we had a variation where we also had another group at the same time for the children, uh, kids under 10, about I think it was, um, 
so that they could have an opportunity to talk about how they felt, what they were thinking, what it was like for them, for their family, to be get, parents to be getting divorced. Um, and that was, that was very effective. So that, that occupied quite a while in my career as a, a part of my counseling practice. How did you first become aware of the ACLU? What drew you into the organization? What drew me into the organization was I, I, my second husband, Harold Levine, was uh, just at early, at the, early in the first year or so of our marriage, somebody came to him to ask him for money for the ACLU office in Cleveland. And at that time, the ACLU of Ohio office was in Columbus, and other, other organizations in other cities in the state were chapters. Um, and they were, the pitch for asking for money was that the office didn't have enough money to run itself in Cleveland. And they were asking him for the enormous sum of $50, which stunned him. He thought there was, had to be something wrong with that thinking if that was the amount they were asking for. Um, and he got involved in the fundraising so that the Cleveland office could stay open. And he stayed involved in fundraising for ACLU for the remainder of his life, actually, which is about 20 years longer. So I had known about ACLU. You know, those are things you say, how did I first hear about the ACLU? I have no idea. Um, but I do think, I was reflecting on this, I think my brother was a supporter of the ACLU. He's five years older than me and a big influence on me. And I think I heard about it from him first. But then, you know, as Harold got involved, I got more involved. And that's how it started. As you mentioned, your husband, Harold, was also a very dedicated member of the ACLU. Tell me a little bit about your shared interest in civil liberties issues. <laughs> There, there was something for Harold that was core about fairness, um, and tran that translated for him in, in terms of civil liberties as what was right was just right. And he, he wasn't broad-minded about his ideas about right and wrong. Um, and I think that the ACLU's approach of really taking up the issues of people who were being treated unfairly made sense to him. Um, and I think if you're a social worker, the ACLU makes sense to you um, because you see people who, it may not be a literal legal civil liberties issue, but you see people whose lives are in trouble from no fault of their own sometimes. Um, so the way the law works in favor of or against people becomes a major issue. In 1981, you were part of a team of people that helped bring Judy Chicago's art exhibition, The Dinner Party, to Cleveland. What was your motivation for working on that project? <laughs> well, there's another longtime ACLU supporter, Mickey Stern. And Mickey had seen The Dinner Party on exhibit uh, in one of its first exhibitions. And she came home from that and said, you have to see this. We have to bring it here. It has to be seen. It's, there's been a lot of trouble getting it exhibited. Places that had agreed to exhibit it were backing out. They, they were hearing about controversy that was being made out of nothing. Um, and museums are notoriously conservative, so they weren't going to risk their reputation on something that might be con con controversial. Um, so Mickey organized a little cocktail party at her house, and she showed a film that's called Right Out of History, The Making of the Dinner Party, which was, it was a documentary of how the dinner party was made, the studio that Judy Chicago created, the people who came into her studio to do both the needlepoint and the ceramics work that are part of the art of the dinner party, and especially the people who came to the studio to do the research on the history of women in Western civilization that was the basis of how they chose who would actually be seen uh, in, the, in the exhibit, who would be represented at the table. Um, so it's Mickey that did that. 
and and we got very both Harold and I got very excited about the artwork, um, but especially about what it stood for, about the the absence of women's history in our in our education, in in just the general media. There, when I saw the women whose names were there were. Um, 38, 38 women, 39 women at, who were pictured at the table, and another almost 1,000 women whose names were inscribed on the floor, which was the base of the table. And I looked at those names and said, I'm uneducated. I don't know who these people are. And I have suffered in my life from the absence of those kinds of role models. The absence, uh, which is a big um, part of what Judy saw when she wanted, when she got the inspiration to do the dinner party, is the absence of women in the history of art, in the history of politics, in the history of science. It's not that there weren't any. It's that the people who write the history say what goes in the history. And for all those centuries, it was the men who wrote the history. And so it was a history of men's accomplishments. And that's what most women of my age didn't know when they were growing up. So it was very important. That's, that is how I got the reputation of being a feminist, because I just kept talking about that everywhere. It wasn't so much what I did, but it was what I said about how life for women is different if they have role models of accomplishment. So that was my involvement, and that was my drive. Tell me about your role as president of the Cleveland chapter of the ACLU of Ohio in the 1990s. How long did you serve as president? I think it was a couple of years. And it was just at the time when Chris Link had been hired um, to be director. And I don't remember what her exact title was then. Um, but, but there was this chapter which was kind of chugging along and, and was beginning to lose steam. Um, and so I was, I was willing to, to do the job as president. Um, and I had really one idea about what would liven up the chapter. And that was that we needed to focus much more on educating people in the community and people who were interested in civil liberties about civil liberties than we were on the, the question of what cases would be taken um, and how they would be pursued, because that really only involves a few people. A couple of researchers, maybe a couple of attorneys, um, and a lot of time building the case. But the people we need as donors to support all that work have to understand what it is that civil liberties means in real life and, and what it means to defend the Bill of Rights as opposed to letting other people interpret it. Um, so the whole idea of broadening the base, of bringing people into the ACLU who weren't lawyers, um, but who had, who would, if you could explain it to them, have a real interest and a commi commitment to seeing that the ACLU survived and thrived. So that was my one big idea. Can you describe the relationship between the Cleveland chapter and the Ohio affiliate in the 1990s? Yes. Um, because the office in Columbus was very engaged in legal work and in advocacy in the legislature, um, and not in broadening the base as much, um, and the Cleveland chapter had a different point of view about what the state should be doing and, and was about doing that, about the education and broadening the base and outreach. Um, and to some degree because of the individuals involved and some sense that people get when they have jobs that they think are important about their turf, uh, there was a lot of friction at the time um, about who was in charge of what and who could do what, and um, it, it probably impeded effectiveness, especially in, I think, donor development and fundraising, and um, it was never anything that was public. 
but um, I think in, you know, every organization survives not just on its public work, but on its infrastructure and the, the ways in which it, it can be and is supported by the staff who do the work. And that was, that was I think, where the toll was of that friction. How do you view the modern day ACLU of Ohio in contrast with the organization from 20 to 30 years ago? Well, this is where I give all kudos to Chris Link. Um, Chris really understands that two sides of an organization and she knew how to build a competent, effective, committed staff that could hold the infrastructure together and make the work of the volunteer lawyers and other people um, possible and, and to become herself a real expert so that she is a spokesman for the ACLU and to have the support that she needed to be able to do that, to develop a broad base of volunteer lawyers that helped to educate her um, and to really cover the state I mean, I don't know how much time she spends traveling or did spend, but in that period of development, just going from community to community, finding the donors, helping those donors find other supporters, revitalizing chapters all around the state and communities outside of Cleveland. Um, so that, you know, we're, ACLU of Ohio now is a very modern, very effective, very efficient organization, and I think she gets most of the credit. You are a passionate advocate for women's rights and the idea of women-centered philanthropy. What is the philosophy behind women-centered philanthropy? So you have to know the history. You know, if you go back far enough, our history in this country and, in, and our, our, our roots in Europe, um, men owned property, men earned money, men supported their wives, women did not own anything. Um, if you go far enough back, uh, men were really seen as owning their wives and children. Um, and, you know, history has meaning. It put that, that philosophy, well, it the fact of it kind of diminished. The philosophy that men were in charge um, and that uh, women were expected to do what they were told in an era when very few women worked or had their own money, when very few women inherited money from their families. If there were men, the men inherited the money. So um, I, I really was growing up in an era of crossover, of change, when women did begin to work um, but still, when I went to graduate school and went to work, my father told me that I would be sorry because my role as a, he didn't say it in this language, but my role as a woman would be diminished um, and that would be a problem for me. Um, on the other hand, my mother said, go for it. You, you can do it. You're, this is something you can do well and you'll be glad you have a career. And as it turned out, I did. Uh, get divorced. I was married when I went to graduate school, and I was fortunate that I had a career and could support myself um, and my son. Um, so all that history, you know, history matters. It, you know, none of us are born today. We we grow up in the in the shadow of the history that was before us, and it influences the way we think and the, what we expect from life. And so in the era when I was working and I was dealing with a lot of families in the process of divorce, I got it that women weren't used to having responsibility for their own lives. They weren't used to having money that either to manage or to earn. Um, and they were unreasonable in their expectations. Because they were uneducated, they were unreasonable in their expectations of okay, we're gonna get divorced and we have X amount of money and I'm gonna have it all. I'm gonna have everything I had before. And, and so that led to re really acrimonious divorces because it was unreasonable. Unfortunately, lawyers supported that because if, if divorce was going to be um, a battle, 
then and you were going to be the attorney for the woman, you were going to tell the woman that she could have everything she thought she wanted. And if you were the attorney for the man, you told him the same thing. So the, that even in the practice of law, and I think that practice has changed a good deal, um, as one of the things that happened was mediation became a way of getting a divorce, and it was the direct result of couples seeing what their friends had gone through and that what had almost inevitably turned out was there wasn't enough money in the family for each of the uh, members of the couple to have the same lifestyle they had before. Something had to give. Um, or there had the woman had to get a job and have to bring in more money. So that it, was a, it, uh, it was a big eye-opener for me in that sense because, first of all, it represented me and my life. Um, the fact that I had a job and money mattered. The fact that my parents had taught me about money and helped me learn how to manage money. I still didn't know what I needed to know, but at least I had a better foundation than a lot of women I met. So the idea that women would think of themselves as in charge of themselves and not as somebody's uh, daughter or wife um, just got to seem very important to me, that women could be who they were in total, in whole, and not just in the part that would be acceptable to someone else's idea. That's how I became a feminist. And how I became, how I applied feminism to women's lives, real women's lives, not just historically. What organizations have you been involved with <laughs> that relate to your interest in women's rights and civil liberties? Well, as a result of my work at Jewish Family Service and the experience I had with women in the process of divorce, um, I helped first the agency start a series, uh, no, the other way. I, I, I was involved with an organization called Cleveland's Women's Counseling, and that has a long history, but what they ended up finding was that 90% of the women who contacted them for some kind of counsel were in the process of divorce, and that's what they wanted help with. So I helped that organization change its identity from women's counseling to divorce equity. Um, and as divorce equity, uh, there were volunteer lawyers and social workers who helped write manuals about the process of divorce. That was one of our major sources of income and also one of our services, is writing manuals about for people in the process of divorce, for women and for men. And then we started doing um, presentations where people could come and ask questions. And we had and the, we had a mediator, a lawyer, and a social worker address those aspects of divorce, the family issues as well as the legal issues, and the virtues of mediation uh, as compared to uh, a legal fight. Um, so that was, was one organization that I helped start and a lot of people worked on very hard uh, that lasted for a long time. Um, it's an interesting observation, I think, about history. By the time divorce became what happened in life to some people and all the clever, obscure bits of information that we pulled together uh, became part of the common knowledge in the community. And there was a cadre of people who had been through divorce so that everybody who was going through it didn't feel weird, but felt like that was one of the things that happened in the life, and, and knew people and could talk to their friends and family who had had experience with divorce. Divorce equity had, didn't have anything unique to offer anymore, so went out of business. I think that, that's a, it's a good model. When you run out of a job to do, you should close down. Um, and so we did that. Your Jewish faith has been a major component of your career and your philanthropy. What does the Jewish phrase, tikkun olam, or heal the world, mean to you? Well, it, it, it means that the world is imperfect as we find it and that it is a virtuous thing to do to work to improve, to heal what is imperfect. Um, and, as, and for me, that always has applied to how people's lives are lived. And um, so as in civil liberties, where people are treated unfairly under the law, 
as in personal life where people don't have the competence or the understanding to lead their lives in a way that gives them satisfaction. Um, that's how I've always applied it. And I've always looked at organizations from that perspective. Um, because I had a long career in direct service in working with people one-on-one, -on -one, um, when I retired, I decided that it was enough and I wanted to work on policy. So all the organizations that I'm involved with now are in some way or other working on public policy, social policy, um, or services um, that benefit people, but I'm on the board rather than on the front line. Can you tell me more about some of those organizations you're on the board of? <laughs> um, my grandson was just here for a week, and, and so he was, you know, living my life with me. He's 12. And after a few days, he said, how many boards are you on? A lot. Um, and I wasn't doing any work. I was just entertaining him, but I guess it comes through. So I'm um, currently president of the board of Cleveland Public Theater, which is an avant-garde theater that has as its mission stimulating people's thinking and enriching their lives through the arts. Again, it's, you know, strengthening people's lives. Um, and does a major educational program uh, that is, one, one is a summer program that's both an, an employment training program uh, and an arts program, and they do programs through the city at the end of the summer. Um, and uh, uh, an arts, program with kids who live in public housing. Um, so that's that's just been a great experience. Um, I'm also on the board and have been for a while of Idea Stream. That's the public radio, public television vehicle in Cleveland, um, which has as its mission strengthening the community. And I'm currently on the board of a national organization called Corporate Accountability International, which has as its mission um, uh, interfering with the abuse of people by transnational corporation and has worked um, on the, tobac the tobacco company's abuse of people by promoting smoking to young people um, and, you know, historically denying that smoking was addictive or unhealthy. Um, also has a campaign on food about not addicting children to junk food and teaching them bad eating habits, unhealthy eating habits. And currently is undertaking a campaign on preserving the access to public water as opposed to the water companies that are now seeking to privatize water. So it's this, you know, it's just a different variation. Now I'm uh, ascended to the international level. Um, I'm also on the board of the Mount Sinai Healthcare Foundation, which um, is a, f a fund granting uh, organization that serves Cuyahoga County um, and funds organizations that deal with people's health in a whole variety of ways, from very small, you know, um, aftercare groups to very large public policy on foods in school. It's a very broad funding pattern, and something I'm probably leaving out, which I can't think of at this minute. You have been a remarkable activist and champion for civil liberties for over 40 years. What do you feel is your greatest contribution to civil liberties in Ohio? <laughs> I was involved with the group that hired Chris Link. I think that's a great contribution. And I've been a steady supporter financially, which every nonprofit needs. It needs a, a group of people who actually um, don't have to be persuaded every year to make a contribution at a, what I, it's often called, at a level that's meaningful for them. So s small dollar contributions can be very meaningful to people with smaller amounts of money. Um, and. Uh, supported the fundraising. I worked on the fundraising. Um, and I've been a continuous giver. And I think that's important. 
Tell me about ACLU leaders that you have worked with over the years. Oh, that's really hard. Um, the first one who comes to mind is Herb Weiner, who is also a substantial donor to Ohio ACLU um, and who has used his skills as a, a business person to help the organization be stronger in a business in its business practices um, and also has done fundraising training so that members of ACLU can be meaningfully occupied as competent fundraisers. Um, I think of Al Stern who, when he retired, took up as his retirement career uh, legislative advocacy for ACLU and did that as a virtually a full-time job as a volunteer. Um, a number of lawyers that I know who have worked with ACLU, and I'm afraid to start naming them because I'll be in trouble, but the, you know, people who, whose livelihood comes from their law practice, who volunteer their professional time to take cases for the ACLU and handle them as competently as they would if it were income producing cases. And um, because that's the a backbone of ACLU. If we don't have that, we could never afford to pay for the kind of legal time we need. So all of them, whoever they are that I've known over the years have been outstanding people. Thank you so much, Marcia. My pleasure.